welcome to another Career Foundry event this evening with Alex Freeberg, the ultimate data analytics career plan for 2023. Now, I know we've got a big crowd tonight. For anyone joining on Big Marker, it's lovely to see where you're joining from. Um, so just drop your name in the right hand side, you know, why you're interested in data analytics and, um, you know, um, you know, why you're interested in um, yeah, data analytics and a career change into data analytics. We'd love to see all the comments. And for those watching on YouTube and Alex's crowd, we've done quite a few of these before. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we always love uh, your energy and engagement. And do check out uh, Alex's YouTube channel, Alex the Analyst, for anybody uh, who doesn't know it, anyone watching from Career Foundry. Uh, let me just introduce myself. I'm William, Events and Communications Lead here at Career Foundry. And Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech. So we guide you from complete beginner to job ready professional in data analytics and help you land your first job in the field. Uh, we're not any old school. Our programs are so flexible. You don't need to quit your day job to change your career. You get regular one to one mentorship from not one, but two industry experts. That's a mentor and a tutor. And if you don't land a job in 180 days of graduation, we refund your tuition in full. That's our job guarantee. Um, for anybody who's watching in YouTube and is interested in the Career Foundry program, um, just click in the description below and there is a link to book a call. Um, if you want to book a call with a program advisor and ask questions about our curriculum or anything that we offer, I recommend doing that. Um, just a couple of house rules this evening. We will be doing a live Q&A at the end. So if anyone's got any questions for Alex, it's your time to get those questions answered. Just drop them on Big Marker or YouTube or LinkedIn. We are streaming across, across numerous platforms this evening. And uh, we'd love to get uh, your questions answered. Um, Alex, I think that's everything. Uh, Senegal, it's a super international crowd, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Alex, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you. I saw somebody from uh, North Carolina, Jermaine. I just want to give that person a shout out. That's where I grew up. So I grew up in uh, North Carolina. I love seeing I love seeing when people put where they're from because it's like, it's pretty wild. I mean, we got people from Guatemala, London, Bromwick in the UK. Just amazing. Thank you guys so much for joining. Um, thank you guys for hosting this uh, Career Foundry. Huge shout out. Um, I love this topic. Uh, it really has a special place in my heart because I remember six years ago, let me see. Yeah. Six years ago now. Wow. Um, in 2017, when I like was trying to make this transition into becoming a data analyst, and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. There are now a lot of resources online um, on YouTube and like, you know, posts and blogs and whatnot centered around how to break into analytics and TikToks and things like that, that I don't do. Um, but there's a lot of resources now. And when I was first starting out, there was like, there was not many resources, which, you know, as, as a lot of you guys know, that's kind of why I started uh, my channel. Um, and so we're going to talk all about breaking into data analytics. I have a kind of a step-by-step -step, um, playbook on what we're going to be doing. And we have a lot to cover. I always like doing the Q&A at the end. So I'm going to try to, um, you know, not, I could talk for hours. I, if you guys know me, I could literally talk for like three or four hours on this, but I'll try to keep it succinct uh, and we'll make sure we cover every step. Let me see what this next one is. Oh yeah, that's me. Uh, we don't need to read this, uh, but I like data analytics. So let's jump right into it. So we're going to start about, we're going to just start with kind of creating a career plan because you have to start somewhere. You kind of have to create a plan. Um, what I like to do with people, because I do, a, I had a mentorship program for a long time before I started my uh, analytics consulting company. And what I would always tell people, I'm like, you can be any step in this process. You can be anywhere. You could be at the very beginning and have never uh, even heard about what data analytics is. And you're trying to, you know, you want to join this path. Or you could have already learned all the hard skills and now you're trying to get a job. So you can really apply this anywhere. So I kind of am going to start from the very beginning, but, you know, realize where you're at and what you need to do. Hopefully that's really helpful to you. Um, so, yeah, here's what we're going to do. Identify where you're at in the process, create an action plan. And then at the very end, I'll talk about time frames on how long you should try to uh, or how long it might take you for each of these steps. So let's go on over to the first one. The very first thing that I always recommend people doing is learning the skills. It's really, really hard to uh, become a data analyst if you don't have the data analyst uh, or data analytics skills. It's really tough. Um, these are the skills that I recommend people starting with. Now, um, as you're reading through it, as you're looking at it, I, you don't have to learn all of them. 
that is not a requirement. And in fact, um, I don't recommend you try to learn all of them because that just would take forever. Really what I would start with, uh, I would really recommend starting with SQL. I just think it's so fundamental. It's where data is going to be stored. It's in some type of database and you can query the data. I always recommend you start with SQL. Learn things like Excel and a Power BI tool as well, like Power BI or Tableau. So these BI tools are meant to just visualize the data. So with SQL, Excel, and something like a BI tool, you can go a long, long way. In fact, when I got my very first job as a data analyst, I only knew uh, SQL. That's really all I knew. Um, I learned on the job a lot of the stuff I know in Excel now, a lot of the Tableau that I know. And then in my next job, I learned uh, cloud platforms like Azure, and I learned Python. So I didn't learn all these things at the beginning. I kind of taught myself over the years as they became more relevant in my job. The last thing on this list is ChatGPT and AI tools. Um, and I want to take a quick second uh, just to highlight this one because, you know, these AI tools aren't going away. They're speeding up a lot of these things. They're making them um, a lot faster to use. So take, for example, something like Tableau. Tableau just had a conference. They announced that they're going to be integrating AI into Tableau. Um, and this is going to be a huge uh, part of analytics in the future, just having these AI tools integrated into um, these different types of, of systems. Here's what I will say. I, I don't recommend diving right into AI immediately. Although it's on this list, um, I highly recommend learning the basics first. Learn the basics of SQL. Learn the basics of Tableau, Power BI, Excel. Learn the basics because what's going to happen is these AI tools are going to go from zero to 100 really quick, right? And, and if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what it's telling you, it's going to be really hard to actually put everything together and do what a data analyst does. So you want to learn the basics first, then start using the AI tools. And you can even use some of these AI tools to teach you. Like ChatGPT can be a really good, a really good mentor. So that's the first thing that you should be doing, learning the skills. Uh, the next thing, learn these skills. Because I can just say go learn the skills, but you know it doesn't really help if I don't tell you where to go. So let's take a look at this. The first one is self-learning. So you can do this on a lot of different platforms. Ones like YouTube, where I teach data analytics. You can learn from ChatGPT, Khan Academy, and a few others. Um, you can do paid courses. So typically what I talk about is places like Udemy or Coursera where you can go and buy a course or buy a subscription um, and you can actually take it as you go. You can kind of self-pace uh, uh, within a customized course. Then there's like boot camps and online schools. Now, this is where something like Career Foundry falls into place um, where you're going to pay for a boot camp. And what I always tell people on this is I always recommend somebody finding one that has a job guarantee like career foundry i you know i don't take sponsors very easily i have a very uh specific process that i go through career foundry is the one of the very few that i like just because it's a good price and uh you know they also have a job guarantee so some of these other ones look into them um but there's a lot of boot camps a lot of online schools that you can look at but just make sure that they have good mentors because that's really what you're paying for and that they have a job guarantee. That's something you need to look for. Um, and then the next thing is getting a university degree. Now, this one is by far the biggest investment in both time and money, but can have a big payoff um, because you're getting more accredited. You know, you're taking a long time to get your education. Um, but here's what I will say. And I, I kind of been thinking about this a lot over the past several months, you know, in three, four, five years, will university degrees uh, be caught up with a lot of these new AI tools and advancements that are happening in analytics right now? Probably not. And you may get a degree and you may not be as job ready as some of these other ones. Like if you took um, self-learning or a paid course or a boot camp, that's kind of has newer information. You really need to look into those things because that is a problem with the higher education as a whole at the moment is they kind of tend to fall behind. So those are your options for where to learn. After you, and this one, uh, I'm going to preface this one. This one actually has multiple reasons why. Um, and building projects is so important. Now, what does it mean to actually build a project? Building a project just means, you know, as a data analyst, you work with data, 
but you have to make insights out of it. You have to make it actionable. So you're taking this data and then you're saying to a stakeholder or an employee or your boss or whatever, you're saying, hey, here's what you should do based off the data. And that's what building projects is. It's basically giving you um, some experience without actually having experience. So you're, you're practicing these data analytic skills that you just learned and now you're building projects. Now, why do you need to build a project? There's three different reasons. Uh, first, you'll just get better at the skill. You troubleshoot things, you run into issues, and you figure it out. And then you work through it and you're like, man, I am better because I you know, built this project. The next one is to showcase your skills to potential employers. Now, this number two and number three, because if you look at number three, it says you'll have something to talk and uh, about during your interviews. So it has two different pieces. One, projects are really great to place on your resume to help you get into an interview because it can show that you're working on these things. You can show the tools that you're using. Um, and it honestly, I've seen a lot of uh, resumes in my day back when I was an analytics manager where I was like, man, this is a really interesting project. And I went onto their portfolio website and I checked it out. I'm like, this is really good. The next thing is, is especially if you don't have any experience, what's going to happen when you get asked something like, uh, you know, tell us how you know SQL. That's a tough question to answer um, when you're first starting out. It was tough for me. Uh, so, you know, I would I would be like, well, you know, I've been practicing and I took a course and, um, you know, I think I'm I think I'm good enough in SQL. And they're like, that's a terrible answer. Um, and it was. But what I learned is when I started building these projects, I could say, you know, they'll ask me the same question. You know, how, what do you know about SQL? And I'll say, well, I, you know, I, I know how to do joins and window functions and all these things. And I just built a project taking this data set um, and I built this project. And I can walk through and I can point to that as some experience as I have built it from data uh, using real data and I built this project. So that's the kind of the three reasons why I recommend somebody build a project and then put it into a website, uh, which is really um, good as well. So this is the uh, portfolio website that I was talking about. So once you built a project, that's fantastic, but it doesn't help if you don't put it somewhere. So what you need to do is you need to take projects, multiple, and you need to place them somewhere. You can do that for free on a lot of different places. I have a whole video on how you can put it up on GitHub. So you can do that. You can put it up on Wix, on Kaggle, Medium, LinkedIn. These are all places you can place your projects. And LinkedIn even has a place where you can go onto your homepage and you can add projects to your you know, profile. So when a potential employer or a recruiter goes onto your LinkedIn, they can see those projects. Really, really great. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. So um, I definitely recommend that. The next thing you need to do is build a resume. Now, um, building a resume is always difficult. And give me one second while I take a sip. I woke up with a sore throat, so I apologize. Uh, building a resume is always difficult. I have found it probably one of the most uh, frustrating things about just work in general is you have to apply to a job and you have to have a resume. Um, and resumes are extremely tough when you have no experience because then you have like half a page filled up and you're like, I can't send this. Like this, this looks bad. So you need to kind of fill that out and you also need to make it a data analyst focused resume. Now, how do you do that? Um, the first thing that you need to do is highlight your skills. So highlighting your skills means you want to put SQL, Excel, Tableau, Python, whatever skills you have on your resume a lot. And you want that up at the top, especially if you don't have any experience. Like I have a degree in recreational therapy, so I don't want to put my recreational therapy degree at the top because then they're going to see that and they're going to be like, this degree is worthless, which for this field, it kind of is. Um, so I put that at the very bottom and I, I just call it a bachelor's of science. I don't even say that it's a recreational therapy. It's just kind of a healthcare degree. Um, but I put my skills at the top and then I have, um, if you have experience, you put experience, then you put um, at the next level, you can put your projects. So this is another place where your projects are going to come in handy. So you can have your projects in two different areas. And I want to just highlight this because I'm a big, big, big believer in it. Your projects can be an actual section where you say, here's what I did. And then underneath it, you have bullet points of here's the tools I used and here's the analysis that, uh, or the insights that I got out of it. You can also put in your header, a link to your portfolio website. Highly recommend this. 
because then an employer can go and look at your actual code that you're writing or your visualizations that you're creating. They can go and actually look at it. So it's pretty awesome. Um, so those are two different ways. Um, another thing that I want to mention is if you're coming from a different field, so let's say you're a nurse or you're an accountant or it could be anything, a teacher, it's really helpful if you're able to repurpose your uh, experience to be more data analytics focused. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, I've worked with a lot of, because I came from healthcare. So I worked in healthcare for a long time. Then I became a data analyst. So what I did when I was first starting out, and I kind of learned this over the years, is that I actually, that's actually valuable experience. I didn't know it at first. I thought it was pretty useless. Um, but that was actually really valuable. And so what I started doing was, is, you know, I've worked with, um, what are those called? HRI? No, uh, healthcare database systems. Uh, they're called something as I can't think of it off the top of my head. But I would say I have experience with these databases on the, you know, healthcare side. So then when I come in and I'm working as a data analyst on the back end, I can say I already have experience with those systems. I know how to use them. And that's really, really uh, useful information. So you can do that with a lot of different things. You usually have to sit down and think, how is this relevant to data analytics? And then try to use that. It, it can be tough for some jobs legitimately, um, but a lot of jobs, you there is some trans. Now, let's go on to the next one, which is certifications. Um, I'm going to mention certifications, and I, I put this uh, as an optional one here, and I just wanted to touch on it. I personally, uh, I have no certifications uh, or no certifications that I talk about because I don't think they're 100% relevant or have ever helped me land a job. So I've taken uh, the Microsoft Power BI Data Analyst Certification. That's one that I actually took when I was in my job. My job paid for that certification. I don't put it on my resume uh, because I don't think it's it was that helpful back three years ago when I was um, just like a data analyst. I didn't think it was that exceptionally helpful in helping me find a job. But some of you guys may really want certifications. It helps, uh, could potentially help build a little bit of credibility. Uh, you have an actual certification. I just am not a huge proponent of it. So if you like it, go for it. You can get that certification. If not, you know, it's not um, a big one. But these are three of the ones that I think are actually useful are actually worth getting. Although there are thousands of certifications out there, they're just not all really that great. Um, so you know, take it with uh, take it with a grain of salt. The next one, uh, step number five, is to start applying, and this is a very difficult part. Um, when I first started, when I was when I was trying to get my very first data analyst job, I can't remember the exact number, but it was over a thousand jobs I applied for. Um, and I was doing that mostly on ZipRecruiter. I'm trying to ZipRecruiter and LinkedIn, I think is mostly where I applied. Um, and I applied to over a thousand jobs. I think it was like 1200 and I got callbacks for 20 of them and I got offered a job on one of them. Um, and whew, that was a process. I had a whole spreadsheet. It was, um, it was a very dark time in my life. Very, dis very disappointing if I might say because it took months and months and months to get there. Now there's a better way to do this. Uh, don't be like younger me who did it the worst way possible. And I'm sure a lot of, that's what a lot of people do because it's very inefficient. Um, most of these job uh, websites where you're just applying and applying and applying, they get thousands of entries. Some they don't even look at it. Some they just automatically scan your resume and you're like, no, don't have the experience. Then you get tossed out. So it's very, very tough to get a job with no experience or you know, um, if you're transitioning from a different career, very tough. Here's how I would do it if I were you. Um, the first thing that I would do is always work with a recruiter. Now, recruiters are interesting because most of the time they're working in metropolitan areas. They're not gonna be working a lot in these rural areas where it's like farm country, uh, which is you know kind of where I grew up in Minnesota, like near the, in the middle of nowhere. You know, you're not going to find a lot of jobs there. Um, you can now find remote jobs, which is great. But even then, a lot of these jobs want you to be, you know, somewhere near a metropolitan area. So if you don't want to do that, uh, or if you don't, um, if you want to stay where you are, you can look for remote jobs. And there's a lot of companies out there that you can look for online. Just search, you know, remote recruiters for tech. And what you need to do is you need to get on their radar. You need to talk with them, you need to hunt them down, and you need to find them. 
Now, I'm going to tell you what I did uh, when I first found this life hack, which is called recruiters. Um, I went and worked with every recruiter who would work with me. At the peak of working with recruiters, um, after my first job, I had a year experience. After that first job, I was working with about seven or eight recruiters. And all of them, I was messaging every single week. Every single one of them, I was calling once a week just to see if there were any open jobs. I was a bit relentless um, because... I knew they weren't going to do it for me. I had to do it myself. I couldn't rely on them to just message me out of the blue with a job offer. It just doesn't happen. So I took it upon myself. Now, you don't have to be like me, although I kind of think that's it's a very efficient way to be on people's radar consistently and get new job updates when a new job is available. So um, and if you don't know what a recruiter is, I'm going to break it down super quick. A recruiter is usually somebody who's paid for by a company. So let me see where I am on my camera. So here's the company. They pay this recruiter to go find an applicant. Now, this recruiter just works with the company. They usually don't work. Or they're not inside of the company. They're not part of that company. They're just a third party. Um, a third party. Now, they're going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, we have this job at this company for an entry-level data analyst position. Uh, would you be interested? And you're like, yes, of course I'd be interested. So you go and apply and they pay you, let's say, $50,000. The recruiter is not going to take any of your money. The company is going to pay the recruiter, let's say 10% or 5% of your salary as just a lump sum saying, hey, thanks for getting us uh, an employee that we needed. We don't have to do that. Uh, and that's what a recruiter is. You can cold email and you can cold call as many recruiters as you possibly can. I recommend doing that. I think that's even more efficient than just blindly applying on LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter. Um, another thing you can do, and this is kind of that second life hack that I found later on, uh, maybe like two to three years ago, which is using LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been like, it is one of the best tools for job searchers. Uh, is that the right word, job searchers? People who are searching for jobs. It is one of the best tools because you can go and you can find recruiters through LinkedIn by just searching for recruiters at this company. Um, and I actually have a whole video on how to do that. It's, it is amazing because you can search any company. I can go on Amazon right now and I can find 10 recruiters who work at Amazon. I could send them a personal message with my resume attached. I can say, hey, I saw this specific job and you put the job in there. Say, hey, I found this job. I think I'm a really good fit. Here's my resume. You know, Let me know. Um, and you can do that with hundreds of recruiters online. It's, it is incredible the access that you have to recruiters. So all of those things are what I would be doing, supplementing, also applying on LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter and those other websites. I just would not only be doing that because it's, it's, it's a tough path to go down. All right, let's go to the next step. Uh, now we're going to look at timeframes. Give me one more second. So timeframes are really important because you don't want to be doing this process, all the things that we just discussed for the next two years. That's a really long time. Most of the time you're looking, you're hoping to do this within three to six months. Um, and that sounds like a long time, but if you really think about it, you know, I've been in this field for six years now and it has paid off really well. Like it's just taken me into a lot of places even before the YouTube stuff. Um, and so, you know, long-term you got to think six months of my life, you know, really doing these things to get to where I want to be for the rest of my life. So there's, there's, you know, a big, it's a big payoff. The first thing is learning the skills. This is, I think this is going to take the longest um, or most likely will take the longest for most people. Um, if you just focus on the ones that we talked about, like SQL, Excel, and a visualization tool, and you're starting from absolute scratch, like, you know, nothing, um, which I've been there. It's tough. That can take you about two to three months. So really get a good handle on it. There's lots of courses and practice uh, uh, websites that you can use. You know, those are great places to look and to go um, use and utilize. If you're trying to learn all of those skills, that can take you like six months. Uh, if you're trying to learn Python or R, um, or if you're trying to, you know, really learn how to use ChatGPT or some like an AI tool, those things can take you a while to really get good at. Um, so, you know, be easy on yourself, but right around three months or so to learn all the skills um, and start applying. The next thing is building projects. I don't think you need to spend two, three months building projects. Most people can do a project a week. I usually recommend at least having three projects. Five is perfect. So if you can do one project a week, um, and they don't have to be, when you're first starting out, they don't have to be complex. 
keep it simple. I have lots of guided projects on, on my channel. You can just watch a guided project and put that on. Um, it doesn't have to be like a senior level analyst worthy project. It just doesn't. Um, so keep it simple, keep it, um, you know, keep it small and then you can build from there. So, you know, that should take about three to six weeks, one week for three to five projects, about three to six weeks. Next, we have building a portfolio. And really what I mean by that is just taking all your projects, getting into one place, making it look really nice, having a website. Um, if you've never done it before, it, it's, it can be tough. So, you know, just find a tutorial, find somewhere where you can build that and then build that out. It should take about one to two weeks. Then the next thing we have is building a resume. Hopefully this won't take too long. You don't have to start from scratch. Just take your current resume and kind of revamp it, rework it for data analytics. You should be able to get that done in about a week, but two weeks kind of at the most if, you know, resumes are not your thing. The last piece is job hunting and job hunting is like a huge variable. It could, I've seen people uh, and I've worked with people who have literally gotten a job within the first month. Um, you know, they learned, they did all the things that I, that I told them to do. Then they started applying and within a month they got a job. It happens, but it's not super, it doesn't happen all the time. Not super um, common. Usually I'm seeing about three months to land a job. Now I put one to six months because sometimes it takes people six months, sometimes even longer. Depends on where you are. If you're in the middle of nowhere and you're looking at very specific jobs, um, only remote, you know, has to be uh, within this pay range, you know, very specific uh, jobs that you're applying for, it's going to take longer. But if you're open to relocating, if you're open uh, to taking positions that don't pay as much right away to get some experience, um, which sometimes you may have to do, you know, you can get a job a lot faster. So, you know, there's a lot of different variables. And sometimes like I lived in Dallas, which was really beneficial for me getting some of my first jobs because there's a huge hub of companies and, and need for data professionals there. So I was in a good location to be able to get that job. If I was in the middle of nowhere today, I think it'd be, be a quite a bit more difficult to land that first job. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, and that's actually it. Um, so I'm going to get uh, Will back in here uh, in just a second. And I'm sure he's coming. But um, I know that I just kind of, I went through that quick. But you guys can ask me any questions that you possibly could think of and want to know. And I will at least have some answer. It may not be a good one, but I'll have an answer. Thanks, Alex, so much for presenting um, this evening. Let's just clue back to this slide. Um, yeah, I think just to start it off, I, I know a lot of people watching this evening are thinking about taking their first steps in the uh, in the industry, uh, you know, junior uh, data analyst positions. Um, you know, how do you think that the industry has changed in the past six years since you've been working in the industry? That's a good question. I, you know, I'd like to start it off with, a, you know, one, one of the meteor questions. Yeah, that's um that's a great question. It's changed a lot. Uh, you know, I started uh, six seven years ago. The end, it was very different. Um, it wasn't as remote focused. Um, I think it was a somewhat lower uh, barrier of entry. Right now um, is a really interesting time to to be getting in because um, you know we've seen some layoffs um, at big tech companies, but what I will say um, is that. As a whole overall, the job hiring hasn't slowed down that much, except at some of these big tech companies, which is not where most data analysts work. Uh, most data analysts work at a lot of Fortune 500 companies, mid-sized companies, and even small companies. That's where I started. Um, and that's where 90% of data analysts work. They don't work at the big tech companies. Um, so the I think uh, for a lot of junior people, if they're starting out now, the difference between when I started and now is that it's just more competitive. There's more remote people trying to get jobs. Um, whereas back when I first started, there wasn't as big of push for remote work. And so um, there's just a little bit more competition at the entry level because of every, a lot of people just want to work remote. Um, and so if you are in person, if you are in those metropolitan areas, I think you even have a bigger leg up um, in getting those jobs because you're in person and or, or you could work remote. So you have that flexibility. So you can really work um, you know, where they need you, which uh, a lot of companies like. Awesome. And I want to also go back to the portfolio. One more question from my side. Um, talk about sure. portfolios. Um, if if a portfolio lands on your table for a junior position, what excites you most when you see that portfolio land on your table? What do you like to see? 
Yeah, so I, I've worked with um, a lot of entry level people. Like I was a analytics manager. So like when um, we were hiring um, and I had a lot of consultants and a few full-time employees, but um, when I would see one, I'd, I'd look at their portfolio, not a ton had it on there, um, which I prefer them. Some people don't care. Some people really care. Um, I just prefer them. I, I would hope they have them. Um, I remember specifically, there were a few that came across uh, uh, you know, my table where I'm like, this is a really interesting project. I go on their website. I look at this project. I'm like, I have never seen a project like this before. Like it's just really unique on some niche topic. I thought those were super interesting because it showed passion. Um, it showed like a curiosity for just diving into data. Um, and so, you know, I would see ones on like fantasy football and like this, I remember this guy specifically because we ended up hiring him. He had a, this really in-depth portfolio on fantasy football stats. Um, and like it, part of his um, process, it was all in Python. So part of his process was also determining the best position for fantasy football drafts. Um, which positions to take first based off different factors, all, you know, data analyst, uh, uh, using data analyst tools and stuff. It was just really interesting. I love that. I thought it was super cool. It's actually interesting you said that because we've also, um, in previous Career Foundry events, we've had it in the past where a student has taken a Career Foundry project and actually changed it and done their own thing. And then they've landed a job from that. So I think that's great advice too. Um, this is the time to get your questions answered for those uh, watching on Big Marker, LinkedIn, YouTube. I'm going to jump in. Apologies if I pronounce anyone's names wrong. That's not intentional. I think Mia's got a great question over in Big Marker. Um, Alex, any insight into how AI might affect this industry in the next few years? Yes. Um, I just, so I'm, a lot of what I'm going to say, I have a, I just released a video yesterday that's like an hour and 15 minutes on this exact topic. Um, and it goes really in depth, but here's, I'm going to give you the cliff notes of it. I think that AI has a massive potential, uh, somewhat not unlimited, but a massive potential to transform the analytics and just data industry in general. Um, for job seekers like you and I, who are working as data analysts or want to get into data uh, analytics, some of the potential concerns that I've seen are things like it's really good at automating things. It can work at a really fast pace, like a thousand times faster than a data analyst. And it's very cheap. Those are three things that I'm, I think I'm most concerned about. Here's what I'm not concerned about. Here are the things that I think are positive for people like you and I trying to get a job. Um, I think that AI still makes a lot of mistakes. It's getting better, um, but those hallucinations are very real. And you, I wouldn't, because I've been a manager myself, right? So I'm putting myself in like a business mindset. I would not want to blindly trust anything that AI is telling me, ever. I am almost never going to blindly trust it. I'm going to need somebody to dig into the data, make sure that what they're giving me is correct. Go back, look at the code, make sure the code is correct, the data cleaning process, you know, the whole spectrum. That is a, that's a, one of the bigger pieces that I would say is, um, makes data analysts extremely useful and, uh, and very relevant is that as a business owner, I don't, I, I could not put multi-million dollar projects, which is what I would work. I work on a million or $2 million project. I'm not trusting AI to do that. Not right now. Um, and probably not for the foreseeable future. The next thing, um, that I think is, am I, am I talking too much? I need to stop. I no, it's great. I think this is great. I think because okay. I mean, AI, AI is the buzzword at the moment. So I think, please elaborate on this, this topic. All right. Well, I talked about it for an hour 15 before I could, I could talk longer than that. I, so I don't want to, um, I, I'm going to try to, I'll try to keep it more concise than I think I was going to be. Um, the other piece is that you have to think about most businesses and companies integrating AI into their, into their, uh, world. Um, when I, was managing a team of six, seven people. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about AI, how I would have integrated it. Cause it really wasn't a big thing when I was a manager. I, I would take a lot of precautions because, you know, I, we had a lot of important data that made important decisions. And so I would be very careful with implementing it. Um, and that could be a year long plus process. So it, I think just in terms of actually getting it into a lot of workplaces, at a, at a company level is going to take a long time. I think ChatGPT has done a pretty good job of integrating at a personal level to speed up workflows. 
But integrating these AI tools into an actual business is, I think, going to be a lot more complicated than I think people understand, um, especially if you're not a data person, right? If you don't understand how these tools work, how the data flows, the data infrastructure, um, all the nuances of the data, and you just try to plug and play, like, I don't see it working uh, well. Um, and so I think those are all, those are some of the bigger things that I think um, is going to keep a lot of data analysts very busy. Some of my predictions for the future of AI. I think freelancing in AI, uh, freelancing as a data analyst is going to become really big. Um, and I, I said that, and then a day later, Tina Huang, if you know her, she's a data scientist YouTuber, made almost the exact same prediction. I messaged her, I said, hey, you just made like the same prediction I did. She's like, I recorded that video a week ago. We had no idea. But we had the exact same prediction, which is, a lot of smaller companies are going to need to start using these AI tools and they do not have the data infrastructure built up. They do not know how to use AI tools. They're some Joe Schmo in a business and they're like, I need to use this to stay afloat. So I think freelancing as a data analyst and knowing how to use these AI tools is gonna to be a huge business. You'll see a lot of things on like Fiverr and Upwork or small little niche businesses like mine pop up and people are just going to, you know, start their own businesses. So I think freelancing is going to be a big thing um, because a lot of small companies that have never used this stuff are going to want to use it. I, I'm a lot, like hundreds of thousands of companies, um, you know, around the world are going to start having to use these to keep up with the pace. So that's one of my predictions. Um, another one of my predictions, and uh, let me look at this real quick because I, I have it pulled up in front of me real quick. Um, so data freelancing. I think um, this was another interesting one that I had thought about um, that I don't I don't know if anyone else is talking about it, but I think it's cool. Um, I think that as AI tools get into different departments within a company, you'll see more nuanced data professionals, something that a data analyst would do, except now it's nuanced into that specific department, whereas they wouldn't have had that before. So something like I, I wrote this down, I, you know, sounds kind of weird, but something like uh, an HR AI analyst or an HR AI specialist, something that may not even have the word analyst in it, but it, it does that similar work where you're taking HR data and you're finding insights where they may never have done that before. But now they feel like, you know, we need to get into this. Um, so you'll see, I think you'll see a lot of that popping up in within companies, a lot more data centric AI you, uh, people. So um, that's that's one of my predictions is that the data analyst title is going to change over the next five years. Um, it's going you're going to see more AI analyst. You're going to see more data analyst using AI. You're even going to see people like um, like AI professional or AI um, AI data. I wrote it down the other day, but you're going to see a change in the job titles as these tools get integrated. Um, and I think they'll come slowly. I actually don't think it's going to happen like super quick. You'll see like one or two pop up every so often, but I think in five years, it'll be a pretty good mix of just a data analyst, business analyst, you know, a marketing analyst, and then like data AI analyst who you need to know how to use this AI tool or, or know how to use these types of AI tools to work at that position. I'm just predicting AI, Alex, the analyst popping up on the YouTube as a... <laughs> We'll see. We'll um, see. But I, there was one interesting point I think you made there on the having the expertise before. And this is something which has come up in some skills workshops that we've done too, is that, for instance, I could write something in chat GPT, you know, what is nuclear fusion? What is this? What is that? And, you know, with, for me, with no experience, it does look, it, it looks right. But you need to have the expertise <laughs> in the field to be able yeah. to reflect on actually what the answer is and, you know, what's what's the truth and what's not the truth. So yeah. I, I think I think you pulled up a really important point there is that actually you need to be a little bit of a level ahead to see what's wrong and what's right. Um, so I think well, that's let me great touch point. on that actually, um, because what's really interesting is right now you see people like developers who are using ChatGPT to build products. Here, uh, there's it's super interesting. I've been seeing it everywhere. Everyone's like, I could be a dev tomorrow, and they're not that wrong. And here's why: because you can ask ChatGPT to build something. You can plug it in to whatever ID you're using, um, and you just need some base knowledge of how to use that. And it can you can visually see that your product is working. Now, if you want to go further and you want to make alterations and get you know add a backend database and do all these other things, you have to know what you're doing, right?
But at an entry level, or not even entry level, but at a very base level, a lot of people can plug and play and build something um, like a dev. But once you start getting to the more complex stuff, ChatGPT can only kind of recommend things. It can only help you. It can't build that database for you and connect it to your um, to your front end and build all the UI. And the, it just it can't do that stuff yet. Um, maybe it will in the future. Analytics is going to be very similar uh, in the fact that you can build something, but something that's different than even dev work is that devs can see it. They can visually see this is correct. It is working. Analytics is very, in my opinion, is a little bit more nuanced because um, there's a lot of different business use cases. So we're going to see people will be able to generate a lot of stuff, but is it right? That's when you need somebody who knows how to dig into the data, be able to use ChatGPT and these different AI tools to validate that these things are actually working and are correct and are not just giving me some random information that makes no sense and doesn't help the business at all. So um, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of that going on. It's um, but yes, knowing the base tools, how they work, how analytics works, um, understanding that process is going to still going to be extremely important to know how to do. And especially at the mid-level, senior level, it's going to be, you, you have to know those things. You can't just rely on ChatGPT or an AI tool. And if that's not inspiration to, do, to learn uh, data analytics, I don't know what is. Um, so Alex, um, you're fully in belief that um, it's a future-proof career then. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to make that claim. I don't think it's future proof be in, in very nuanced areas. I think that there are some data analyst jobs out there that should have been automated a long time ago, um, that are just super simple. They didn't need to be a data analyst job in the first place. There's tools that 10, five, 10 years ago that could have automated that away. Um, so I think in the broad spectrum of data analyst jobs, very realistically, I would say there's probably five to 10% that have a high likelihood of um, being automated in like 10 years, um, where an AI tool will do most of it. They'll just need somebody to kind of maintain it. I think that 80%, 90% plus is still going to require data analysts to be hands-on um, doing this work. Just because there's so, I, I, I just... With my domain knowledge and my industry knowledge that I've worked for the past seven years uh, hands-on, I could not imagine any business, like my my old company is called Amerisource Bergen. My old company, if they tried to implement AI right now and do that, it would be an absolute disaster. I could only imagine how much money we would lose from all this business that we were, we were working with using AI and making a mistake and letting and trusting it. Like I just, it would be, it would be a horrible move. So integrating those tools and then knowing how, learning how to use them, scaling that up is going to be multi, multi, multi-year process. And there's going to be a lot of jobs that come up. So those five to 10% of jobs that do go away, I think will actually be highly, uh, uh, will be overly repurposed into different jobs in the future. So that five to 10 that goes away, I think it'll be about 20% upswing with all these smaller businesses, freelance jobs and everything in the future. So um, I don't wanna just say it's foolproof. I just think you need to know the skills, know the tools and know your audience and your market so that you correctly align with that. So you do have a job and a place to work in the future. Excellent answer. And I also think I'm um, just harking back to the AI um, conversation we were having earlier. For anyone who is learning data analytics, it is worthwhile just keeping up to date with everything that is changing in the industry, you know, reading blogs um, like the Career Foundry blog, just a shameless blog there. Um, but also, um, you know, just keeping up and seeing AI as a kind of, you know, something to work with as opposed to something to just ignore. Um, because it's it's not going away, so it's it's good to start. And for anyone who is um, who has been inspired this evening to start their um, their own journey in data analytics, I am going to post a link to the Career Foundry short course um, on Big Marker. If you are thinking about taking those first steps, it's a, a free five to six day short course which will take you on those first steps. Uh, going back to the questions, there was a great question here from Alan over on Big Marker. Um, for those without a technical background, what do you think are some of the most important transferable skills that lead to a success as a data analyst? Um, so I worked, um, uh, uh, sorry, I was <laughs> blanking on the name for a second. I worked with a guy named Sergio. Um, and if you follow me on LinkedIn, you may have seen Sergio Ramos. Um, 
love the guy. I worked with him. He was my mentor. He worked in a warehouse um, using like forklifts and stuff like that. And he was like, I really want to be a data analyst. I was like, let's do it. So he became uh, my one, my very first mentee that I ever had. And now he works at PayPal as a data analyst. Um, here's what I, and I, and I, I say that because it's very much a similar story. And here's what I recommend with him. Here's what I did with him. I said, first and foremost, you have to learn the skills. So he's like, all right. So he, he busted his butt just trying to learn those skills, learn the skills really well. I was really impressed. I was like, Hey, you learn, you learn this really well in like two, three months. Great job. I was like, all right, build projects. So he hustled, he built those projects. Then I was like, apply. This is where he really stood out. He did exactly what I told him to do and what I wish I would have done and what I kind of talked about earlier, which is reach out to as many recruiters as you can, bug them until they help you find a job. And just, you have to be kind of like a little bit shameless. And he did that. And he literally was like, every, every, every week, he'd be like, hey, just messaged all my recruiters, just messaged all my... Um, uh, or just called all my recruiters and 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 whatnot, and, he, and eventually he got his first job at um, as just a um, a consulting job. Then he, at six months after that job, he applied for another job, got another six months, he had a year, and then applied to PayPal, got a PayPal job, all using recruiters. So if I were you, if I were just starting out, you don't have any relevant technical experience, and he literally had none. He didn't even have a college degree. He literally just had got out of high school, started working in a warehouse. Um, is that your passion and your drive and your just your ability to keep going and work through these steps is really important. Um, so he just had a really positive outlook on it. He didn't let it get defeated. He just kept pushing. And when he landed that first job, I mean, he just worked and worked. He was a hustler. Like I call Sergio, he's a hustler because he just kept hustling. Um, and so I think part of it is like just, um, you know, I think learning the skills, good resume and working with recruiters super important the other thing i will say is a good personality somebody who is good at interviewing or practice you can practice interviewing have a good personality that goes a long long way especially with recruiters when you're working with them to make sure they don't you know blacklist you um or getting interviews and like talking with a hiring manager your personality goes a really long way so those are the things that i think are most important are those are things that i did and i that Sergio did that made him really, uh, really successful, even with almost no qualifications. It wasn't the same Sergio Ramos who used to play for Real Madrid, was it? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, different one. Sean has got a great question over on Big Marker. If you're looking into becoming a data scientist, would being a data analyst be a good starting point? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. Um, I think that it definitely can be. And in fact, um, my third year as a data analyst, I was working at Amerisource Bergen. They're a fortune, they're like the fortune five on the fortune 500 list. They're a huge company. And I was working in this data analytics team, uh, or I was a data analyst on a data science team. And I was really good at what I did. And I started working with the data science team. And after about a year there, they asked me if I wanted to transition to become a data scientist. Um, and so it absolutely is possible. Now I turned that down because I saw the work they were doing and it just didn't interest me. I was like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and it wasn't my thing, but a lot of people love data science. And so um, I I know for a fact, you definitely can do it. Um, you kind of have to, I won't, I don't know if I want to say upskill, but you have to change your skill sets as you go. So like analytics is very focused on, you know, the data collection, on the data cleaning, um, pre-processing, uh, and then visualization as well. Whereas data scientists, they do some of the data collection and pre-processing for their stuff, but they also need to know some of the machine learning models. So you have to skill up in different areas. Um, but it absolutely can be a definitely a good stepping stone. I've seen a lot of people do it and message me and say, hey, I was a data analyst, became a data scientist after two years. And I was like, that's awesome. And, you know, if that's what you want to do, go for it. Uh, and there's some people who become data analysts for life. Like me, I don't see myself um, changing. I, I thought about becoming a data engineer because I was working closely with data engineers and database developers and really loved um, building pipelines. But, you know, it just wasn't something that I was in as interested in at that, in that moment. So there are, you can definitely start with analytics and go from there. There are people who have been data scientists and become data analysts. You know, it kind of is a different, it's just different highways. You get on and off and you can kind of, kind of choose what you want and what skills you want to learn. 
Awesome. Just reading some of the comments on uh, YouTube. Uh, hi, um, everyone watching on YouTube. Also, Alex's audience, we love to see you. you. Always bring great energy. Mandy said that she just saw a chatbot data analyst role. So it uh, just goes to show that uh, there's lots of there's lots of roles coming. It's, it's already happening. <laughs> Um, a great question, I think, um, here from Salma, um, and it, it harks back to the uh, recruiters' questions that you were uh, answering earlier. Um, how do you actually find good recruiters? So recruiters are, um, the, I'm going to give you a, a story real quick, really quick story, and then I'm going to answer that question. When I first was becoming a data analyst, I somebody told me to work with a recruiter, never heard of a recruiter, didn't know what that was. I was very, very like perplexed. I was like, what on earth is this? So a guy tells me he has a job offer for or a job interview for me. I'm like, it's a data analyst job. I was like, all right, cool. I like this is this pays pretty good. I was like, and he says, meet me at this garage that's next to the building. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get murdered. Uh, and I told my wife where I was going, what time I was going. And if she didn't hear from me in an hour from that time to call the police, that is actually what happened. I look back and it was really funny, um, but I didn't know anything about recruiters. They were very scary to me. It was very like a, just a different world. I wasn't in the tech world. I was in healthcare. So just a different world, right? So you have to understand that you need to be cautious with recruiters. There are some, you need to make sure they're legit, but recruiters, they can be anywhere. I find a lot of recruiters. I found a lot of recruiters on LinkedIn. So there's a lot of recruiters on LinkedIn. Um, like I was saying before, you can go online, look at a company and search for LinkedIn or search for recruiters in LinkedIn, find them and message them. So if you find a job, um, a job posting that you really like, and you're like, oh, this would be my dream job. Don't just apply. You apply, then you find the company, you reach out to the recruiter and say, Hey, I just applied for this. Attach your resume. I think it'd be a really good fit. I'd love to chat about this. If you have time, um, just a quick note. And that can put you on their radar, right? They're going to have 50 other people who apply. You might be on their radar and no one else is. Um, another thing that I did and you can also do is search for your area. So I lived in Dallas. So I just Googled data analyst uh, recruiters in uh, Dallas. Now, I quickly found out that sometimes they're called different things. They're called like technical recruiters. They're called, um, uh, there was another term for it. Um, but a lot of it was called technical recruiters for for the Dallas area. That's what I found. Um, and then I started reaching out to them. And that's that that works as well. And you can email, you can call them. Um, and so LinkedIn and cold calling and cold email are the best ones. Now, uh, kind of a this is something that somebody else did. I am not supporting this. Will, don't get mad at me if somebody gets mad at you. All right. For this webinar. But here's what someone else did. He was living up in Canada and he wanted to move to Minnesota, which Canada to the United States. The job that he had required that he live in the United States. So when he was talking to the recruiter, uh, he what he did was he went online, searched for in Minneapolis, recruiters that live in Minneapolis, where he wanted to go. Then he reached out to a bunch of them and said, hey, I live in Minneapolis. I want a job. He got a remote job from Minneapolis and then he moved. So he just went ahead and said, I already live there. I want, I'm going to be there. And he applied and talked to recruiters as if he lived there. So, you know, I'm not saying you should do that, but it did work for him. That's what I'll say. Awesome. Awesome. Um, also, for anyone's watching and considering a career foundry data analytics program, um, you're not on the program alone. You do get the full support, as I said at the beginning, of a mentor and a tutor. That's our dual mentorship model. And we also have a, a team of career specialists and a job preparation course um, all behind you um, uh, to prepare you for getting that dream job um, in tech. So you're not on your own on the Career Foundry Data Analytics program. I'm just going to pick up on one comment over on YouTube, which I think is lovely from Hania. I just want to thank you, Alex. I got my first job and your videos helped me a lot. Um, we love that positivity uh, and congrats, Hania, on landing that job. Um, now, I know a lot of people watching this evening are considering um, jumping into data analytics or taking their first steps. And I think this is a very, very good question from uh, Sering. Um, is it necessary to be good at maths in order to be successful at data analytics? At math? Math, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you guys say maths, which always like throws me uh, off. It's, it's, I say I you know guys, what... but <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of people, they say maths. Um, so, uh, 
here's what I'll say. I was pretty good at math um, in high school and I took like the algebra in college. Here's what I found and I'm trying to be like super realistic. If you know a lot of basic math or you know, um, you know, and you'll learn a lot of it as you try to, you learn the skills to become a data analyst. If you know basic math, you know, you can understand a lot of percentiles. You can understand, you know, division, multiplication, PEMDAS, the, the basic stuff. For an entry level role, that's usually enough. Um, usually you don't need to know a lot of, you won't need to know things like linear regression or, um, you know, just some other more advanced stuff, typically. Now, in the financial world, if you're looking at banking um, or, or so, uh, other institutions within the like fintech, they usually rely more heavily on math. But I worked in healthcare. Um, so my math that I had in high school, college was enough for me. I haven't really gone way above that except for some personal use cases. Um, so I think if, if you know the basics, you'll learn a lot of functions within Excel, within SQL, within Tableau. Those are, if you know those, you're gonna, you'll either learn it or you will know it. It's not, I wouldn't say it's crazy tough. Um, understanding data is not always about math. Um, understanding data is sometimes a lot more about like the context, the domain, understanding of how the data flows. Um, and then usually the end math that you're using is not crazy, crazy complex. Um, or if it is, there's other people there to help you make sure it's correct. So I wouldn't be, you don't have to go and get a degree in like statistics in order to be a data analyst at a lot of places. Although, like I said, there's a lot of quants, which is like um, extreme to the nth degree with, with needing to know math. And there's a lot of fintech uh, finance data analysts that do need to know that level of, of, of math. So, but it's not, it's definitely not the majority. Awesome. Um, we've got someone on YouTube, Joseph, who's doing his algebra homework and wants to, no, I'm just kidding. Um, there's a great question. There's a great question here um, from Circa. Why does a company hire a data analyst instead of a statistician? Um, you know, you can do it. I've worked with statisticians. So um, I worked with two statisticians. They were working in our data science team and they were extremely knowledgeable in, in creating machine learning models, statistics. I mean, way above my head in some cases, they taught me a lot of stuff. Um, but for a lot of the other work, they would just be overkill. I mean, and in fact, statisticians, at least the, from, because I've worked with statisticians at my job and I, there was a company that I consulted with not too long ago that had a, a statistician. They are just very specific to at least from what I found to making sure fine tuning, high, creating hyperparameters for uh, these models, fine tuning parameters, um, creating new equations that'll help with. So it's very math heavy. Um, not that's not always, but a lot of statisticians don't have the base level data knowledge or maybe industry knowledge that you might have with just a regular data analyst like me who really knows healthcare extremely well. And then I became a data analyst, whereas they know numbers really well. And then they kind of work with the healthcare data. So they're just coming from a different side and wherever that job aligns, they would align that. If it's a very math heavy job or they need, they might hire a statistician. If they need somebody to know data cleaning and, and the domain knowledge, they'd hire a data analyst. Thanks, Alex. Um, another interesting question that we do get through and from Stephen, um, I had 33 years in IT and want to Ooh, come out nice. of retirement. I did some analytics for 15 years of my career. Can a senior citizen, 69, have a reasonable chance of landing a job? Yeah, it's it, it, that's really that's a really interesting question. I just had this talk with my father-in-law. Um, so I'm at a tiny tangent. I'm going to come back. I'm going to it's going to be on point, though. My father-in-law is 67 years old, and for most of his career, he worked with logistics. So um, he worked in um, just a, a few different companies working with transportation logistics. Super smart guy. Um, his experience allowed him later in life, when he was 65, to work for two years consulting with, uh, you know, I think it was like uh, PwC or Bain or one of those big um, consulting companies. He had a lot of really good experience. And so they hired him 
when he was 65 years old and they wanted him to keep working for like the next 10 years. Um, I say that because I could see somebody like you potentially being in a similar position. If you have a really, really in-depth knowledge in IT and data analytics, and you really know what you're doing. There are going to be people who value that experience. Um, it's even like in consulting companies uh, who really just want somebody who knows the ins, the outs, how, how systems should work, um, things that new people coming into the field, even senior analysts wouldn't know how to do at in as in depth as you would know. So maybe you don't even go for like just a regular data analyst job. Maybe you go for like a chief data officer job at a small company um, or some higher level manager position at a smaller company where you're more managing than hands on. That seems to be where you would fit in, I think, more. Um, that'd be kind of my very quick analysis of, of, of your situation. Awesome. For those of you also uh, watching on Big Mark, I'm just going to post a link to um, Career Foundry's um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Report. And you can have a look if I can post it on Big Mark. Here we go. Send. Doesn't seem to be sending. Because I posted it in the wrong channel. Here we go. This one. Um, yeah, you can um, in the report, you can see um, the breakdown of our student body. Uh, I do recommend uh, checking it out for anyone who's interested uh, in doing a career foundry program. Um, uh, I've just posted a link over in Big Marker, so do check that out. Um, I'm just going to jump into the questions again uh, on Big Marker. Let me go down. Um, let's have a look. So what? Um, so Mumama's um, asking, what career planning advice do you have for someone who is at the beginning of their career in their first data analyst job? I suppose this is a kind of like a pathway question. Yeah, if you if you just got at your first data analyst job, first off, congratulations because that's super exciting. Um, you know, looking back, I, I think I stumbled upon a good formula. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I just it just happened. But if you could actually plan it out, that'd be better. Um, here's what I would probably try to do. Um, it's, it depends on what you're trying to optimize for. Are you trying to optimize for salary? Do you want to make as much money as you can within a short time? Do you want to optimize for comfort? Do you want to work remote? Um, really, I would be jotting down what's most important to you. In the beginning of my career, it was all about money because I was broke. So I like really needed to optimize for money. But then after about three years, I needed to optimize for remote work because of COVID and I had three kids. Um, so knowing what's important to you is really important. But really what you can do is after about a year of working as an entry-level data analyst, at one year you can then start trying to apply um, for mid-level roles. Now, excuse me, drink too much water. Uh, what a lot of people think is, or kind of the old school way of thinking is, oh, I need to work at a place three, four, five years, and about five years I'm a mid-level analyst. This doesn't really how it works in at least this field or hasn't for probably the past 10 years. Things move really fast and you learn a lot on the job and your, your, your skills become a lot more valuable to an employer when you have actual hands-on experience at a company. So once you get a year experience, you can then start job hopping if that's what you wanna do. You can go to another company get a year there in a different field or the same field, job hop and get probably 20% to 40% pay bumps um, if you do it right. That's what I was looking at uh, with mine. I was doing about, about 20 to 40% for each pay bump. So if you're optimizing for money, that's a great way to do it. Um, but you should really be writing down like, what do you want to do in two, three years? Because it's a short life, not a short lifespan, a short um transition to the next stages of a data analyst, mid-level, senior level. You can get to mid-level, you know, one to five years, somewhere in that range, senior level, four to eight years. So you need to start planning, like, what do you want to optimize for? And then try to try to follow that. That's what I'd recommend. For those people who are studying uh, data analytics and that they, they want the highest salary possible after learning data analytics, what would be the, what would be the avenue to go down if you wanted to, to hit the highest uh, salaries? What would you specialize in? Yeah, this 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 would be, I don't want to say controversial. I think other people have different opinions. That's what I'll say. My opinion is that I would optimize for an industry. I think industry knowledge, especially in the coming years, five, 10 years, it is going to be more important to know domain knowledge than ever before because of AI and, and knowing these tools. I think domain knowledge is, is just going to be uh, 
probably one of the more important things, technical skills and your domain knowledge, for sure. I would be specializing in a domain, whether it's finance, construction, agriculture, whatever it is, become really, really good at it. Um, I think, I think that will lead to more money in the long run. Now, if you, you know, if you want to make the really big bucks, you're looking at potentially things like consulting, working at big tech companies, or um, really focusing in on that domain knowledge. So you you have different avenues, um, but I think the most the quickest way to get there, as well as probably the easiest way to get there, is specializing in a domain. If you try to go get an Amazon, go to Amazon right away to get a big salary, it's going to be really tough to break in because it's just a lot of people who work there. Or a lot of competition. So that's what I would do. I would recommend finding an industry that you like, becoming really good at it. I think that's going to be really important in the next several years. Awesome. Uh, a quick question also, um, when you're a data analyst and um, how much does kind of strategy come into play? So you've got the company data, you see that there's some problems, uh, you, you, you visualize it, you present it to the company. Do you also stand there in the boardroom or in the meeting and say, look, this is what's going on with the data from the company and these are potential solutions or are you just the delivering the message? Um, yeah, so um, I have different experiences at different companies and different positions. At my first job, I was a data analyst at a very small, if under 50 people, um, healthcare analytics company. With that job, I mostly reported to the clients um, and then I mostly reported to my boss. So my boss was, um, he was the director of like analytics, right? So I mostly reported to him. Um, when I worked at the Fortune 500 company, when I was just a data analyst, I had just broken in, I, we worked at a larger team. So at the small company, I was just reporting to like one guy. At the, um, uh, at the Amerisource Bergen, I was working as a team of about like 12 people. So our team would come together and I usually present to the whole team because we were a part of a long process of the data collection process, the data cleaning process, transforming it, doing all that stuff, creating the visualizations. We had a person for everything, database engineers, database developers, um, uh, visualization specialists. We had the whole gambit, uh, data scientists. And we would then report up to the program manager who then would report, we would present that to them first. Then we were present that to um, either my manager or my manager's manager, who was the senior director of data science. Um, and after that, we never went higher than that. Now, in my last job, I was an analytics manager. I reported directly up to the CIO um, and the senior vice president of IT. So I think it depends. It, just as a data analyst, you're typically at a small company is reporting higher. At smaller companies, you're reporting like one or maybe two levels above. And then as a, as a manager, I was reporting up to the highest and then everyone in between I because of just how my role was. So I was reporting to really everybody or presented to really everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, just going back quickly to the Career Foundry data analytics program, because some people are asking about the length. Um, if you can devote 30 to 40 hours a week, um, you can complete the course, um, the program in four months. Um, and if you can devote 15 to 20 hours, you can complete it in eight months. Just to clarify um, for anybody who, who wanted to know that. Alex, um, thank you so much for hosting another fantastic presentation this evening. Uh, also, thanks so much to Alex's crowd. Uh, and I would also just like to say quickly um, to anybody who's watching from Career Foundry, do subscribe to Alex's YouTube channel. Um, over, it's Alex the Analyst. Uh, it's currently at 470,000 subscribers and we want to get it to 500. So do go over there and subscribe. We've got to get to 500 by the end of 2023. Uh, it's, it's, it's a combined goal. Um, but yes, thank you so much for all the great questions, all the engagement this evening. For anybody who's watching and is interested in data analytics, I would also recommend checking out the Career Foundry blog. I'm just posting a link over on Big Marker. There are some very specific topics on tools, um, salaries, but there's also some uh, more general topics there on soft skills, transferable skills, um, and uh, jobs in your locality, that kind of thing. So do check it out. We've got a great team of editors working at Career Foundry, writing these articles, and they would love for those to be read. Also, do check out the Career Foundry YouTube channel. 
you can see previous live events that we've done over there, um, but you can also see members of the team who've been interviewed and people that we've interviewed, alumni. Uh, do check that out. There are some familiar faces, especially uh, in the data analytics section. So uh, I would recommend going over there, especially checking out the videos from Tom Gadsby, who is uh, the senior data uh, scientist here at Career Foundry. He's got some great uh, introductory YouTube videos, so do check that out. And last but not least, if anyone is considering a career change and is thinking about Career Foundry, we are currently offering career change scholarships worth up to $1,125 or 1,125 euros off the full price of the program. Uh, to get that or to apply for that, just book a call with the program advisor. Um, if you're on YouTube, click the link below in the description, or if you're on Big Market, click the sticky note um, and uh, speak to one of our program advisors. Uh, they're lovely, I know them all personally, and they can also answer any questions that you might have about the dual mentorship model, the curriculum, job guarantee, all those kind of things. Uh, and they're waiting uh, on the calls now. Um, Alex, thank you so much. Are we gonna see you again this year? Probably. I, hope I, so. I, I, ho I hope you'll have me back. I love doing I these so. webinars. I hope so. We're going to we're going to find a topic. We're going to find a really juicy topic. So we're, we're going to get you back <laughs> on the channel. Uh, but thank you so much for spending your time this evening. And that was a great presentation. And thanks to everybody who joined us from all over the globe. A great international crowd and a great evening. So thank you, everyone. And uh, see you next time.